Coming up on News 3, what we know about the major crash that happened this afternoon on Holloman and Welburn. And today is the 20th anniversary of the massacre at Columbine High School. A look at how survivors are coping two decades after the tragedy. And we enjoy plenty of sunshine here across the Brazos Valley, but we have changes coming as early as this week. Local. Trusted. This is News 3 at 6 on KBTX. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Clay Falls. Whitney Miller is off tonight. Several people are injured after a major accident this afternoon at Holloman Drive and Welburn Road in College Station. The crash happened around 1 o'clock this afternoon. News 3's Rusty Surratt was there and reports three people have been rushed to a hospital. We are working on gathering more details from police on how the crash happened. Police say the intersection could be closed until 9 tonight and drivers are being asked to avoid the area. An update to a story we first broke on our KBTX Facebook page yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, this accident happened on Booneville Road in front of Allen Academy. A Hyundai accident crashed into the school's fence. Bryan police now say the man in the car was driving drunk. He was taken to the hospital for treatment for the crash, and police say they found multiple empty beer cans inside the car. Police say 66-year-old Joseph McBride of Pasadena told them he had three beers and said, I'm guilty. He is still in the Brazos County Jail tonight on more than $3,300 bond. Exactly 20 years ago today, two students shot and killed 13 people at Columbine High School. It was the first mass shooting at a school for the millennial generation. As that community honors those who died tonight, Natasha Chen talks with survivors about life after tragedy. On a hilltop next to Columbine High School is a quiet space filled with 13 plaques naming the people who were killed on April 20th, 1999. The community of Littleton lit candles Friday night standing by the friends they lost. Among them are people who could have died that day. Survivor Patrick Ireland, who was shot twice in the head. Fortunate that, <clears throat> that I'm still here and, and was able to, you know, regain so much of my life back. Frank DeAngelis was Columbine's principal at the time. He now dedicates his life to helping school shooting victims. Whenever I go out and do presentations, I start each of my presentations with the picture of each of the kids and I read their names and it gets me in a calming place that I know what I need to do. Survivors like Will Beck have also been approached by Parkland, Florida students. He says, don't be afraid to live your life. It was horrible. It like dominated my life for a long, long time, but I still have a beautiful family and I have a life that I was able to rebuild from that. Having a, a choice of being a victor instead of a victim can be a great positive message. In Littleton, Colorado, I'm Natasha Chen reporting. A Zoom employee in Topeka, Kansas is reportedly in stable condition after being mauled by a tiger this morning. According to zoo officials, the tiger's primary keeper and the endangered tiger entered the same space as one another. That's when the tiger pounced on the employee. The zoo was open at the time of the attack and it was witnessed by some guests. It reopened about 45 minutes after the attack. Zoo officials are saying they don't plan on euthanizing the tiger. Sanjeev uh, this morning did exactly what a tiger would. Uh, when something comes into its territory. And uh, there is absolutely no consideration to euthanize Sanjeev. Officials are investigating what exactly led up to the attack. Authorities say a Houston woman set herself and her home on fire when police showed up to arrest her for her husband's murder. 69-year-old Janet Alexander allegedly stabbed her husband, 64-year-old Lionel Alexander, to death in the home in April 2018. She said she stabbed him in self-defense after they got into an argument that escalated. A grand jury decided to charge her. Firefighters pulled her out of the burning house alive, and she was taken to the hospital to recover what will be charged with murder when she's let out. The Hearn Family Dollar is celebrating their grand reopening Saturday after merging with the Dollar Tree. The Family Dollar provided bounce castles and games outside their store today to celebrate with the community. The reopening showcased the new items offered to the public after merging with the Dollar Tree. The store now offers catering, savings on more food options, and they expanded their cooler section. have a lot of dollar price points. We're going to carry a lot more product. They don't have to drive all the way into town you know, to go look for all the great stuff that uh, Dollar Tree carries when we carry it right here. The Family Dollar says that the integration of both stores is going to give the community the best of both worlds. Well, don't go anywhere. Erica Page has your Easter forecast coming up. Plus, international negotiations in play 
play a huge part in agriculture, how that's impacting Texas beef, next and From the Ground Up. You're watching News 3 at 6 on KBTX. In the past year, we've seen negotiations and renegotiations with South Korea, Canada, and Mexico. And there are hopes for new agreements with the European Union, Japan, and China making markets more open to U.S. beef. Shell Winkley has more in this week's From the Ground Up. Japan, Korea, Mexico, China, Hong Kong, Canada. Taiwan is right in there too, a small country. Taiwan is amazing. Um, six consecutive record-breaking value years for U.S. beef. And talk about a market where we're really penetrating. We have 75% of the chilled market, and so really we dominate the, the highest value category in, in Taiwan. Aaron Bohr is an economist for the U.S. Meat Export Federation. And so everyone has their, call it normal tariffs that they charge. Um, so in China, uh, since we don't have a free trade agreement, when we ship beef to China, normally we pay a 12% sales tax, call it. And now with the retaliatory tariff, that's an additional 25%, and so they're just added together. So 37% sales tax is what I have to pay now as an importer in China. And if I want to buy Australian beef, I pay six. Borer says the reason for that is that the Australians have a free trade agreement with China, and they don't have any metal tariffs on China. Canada is still paying 12%. Australia is different because they have a free trade agreement. And so their tariff is being reduced to zero. Right now, this year, it's 6%. New Zealand has a free trade agreement as well. They are already at zero. Canada, Brazil, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, the other big suppliers are all at 12. While the U.S. still has a competitive advantage with the quality and availability of beef cuts to exports, the industry's hope is that agreements will be made to level the field for market access. I'm Shell Winkley, looking at Central Texas agriculture from the ground up. From the Ground Up is sponsored by Producers Cooperative, proudly serving agriculture since 1943. Well, I can say if you enjoyed today, I think you're going to enjoy your Easter Sunday as well. We just have some subtle differences that we're working in, but rain chances return tomorrow. I'll get you the details coming up. Get your weather online anytime. A public service sponsored in part by Producers Cooperative. For the latest trending video, subscribe to KBTX News 3 on YouTube. News 3 weather from the Pinpoint Forecast team is sponsored by the Bank and Trust. Local bank, local bankers. And now, local weather. If you like the quiet, calm weather, you like this pattern in the jet stream where it jets up to the north and it leaves us open to some of those warmer temperatures. These dips in the jet stream, those indicate areas of low pressure. And we're watching our next one as it slowly makes its way in off the west coast. But for now, we've still got a couple of days to enjoy some pretty nice weather. High pressure sits in just to our south and it's kept all of the clouds out bay and really just a lot of blue sky out there. And you'll notice out to our west, where we're tapping into some of those really warm temperatures, upper 80s across the panhandle, even 91 degrees out in Am or El Paso, I should say. Notice the eastern half of the state, though, sitting just a little bit cooler. We're talking mid-upper 70s for many of us, but it has been a gorgeous day from start to finish. If you've gotten a chance to get outside, you've noticed it's just been full of a lot of that sunshine. So make plans, get out, enjoy this weather while you can, especially over the weekend. Notice our northern counties, upper 70, mid upper 70s, and then as you head a little bit further out to the south and the west, tapping into some of that 80 degree air. But again, starting off the evening comfortable, and as we progress on through the rest of this evening, I think by the time most of us wrapping up any of those evening plans, it's the 70s or the mid upper 60s for many of us. So going to be a very nice night. And overnight tonight, not quite as cool as what we saw the past night. So I think temperatures rest into the low 50s across our northern counties, mid 50s for the rest of us, and a very light breeze out of the south at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. But again, excellent weather. If you have any of those Easter egg hunts that you are planning for tomorrow, should be good to go. One thing you might notice, though, we've got a little bit of a breeze that's going to start kicking in, especially by the afternoon. So morning plans as you're getting back from church, you may notice those temperatures inching closer to 75 and seeing a few of those clouds mixing in as well. But by the afternoon, expecting a lot of us to reach the low 80s as you finish up 
up your Easter Sunday. Gusty winds out of the south are going to be building in this moisture the next couple of days, and that's where we start to see these rain chances increasing, as especially as we head into the middle part of this next week. It brings back the cloud cover, and it holds those temperatures just a little bit under where we should be average for this time of year. So as we run through your pinpoint forecast of just noticing where this moisture is, the thing I want to point out, you see a lot of green there. We've got a couple of days where we're going to be piling in a whole lot of moisture in the upper levels of the atmosphere that are at first just going to bring us a few of these clouds. But by the time we talk about Tuesday, it starts to translate into some rain chances, especially as storms start to roll through up towards the north. So rain gear on Tuesday may not be a bad idea. Eyes, though, are on Wednesday. Wednesday, the potential is there that we could see a couple of these stronger storms start to roll in as our area of low pressure digs a little further to the south. So what are we tracking? Well, at this time, I think a couple isolated stronger storms certainly remain possible. At this time, the tornado threat remains low. I think if we see a stronger storm roll through, bringing in some of those gusty winds, maybe some of that smaller hail, the thing I'm really focused on is the fact that we're going to see quite likely quite a bit of rain where some of these storms do drop some rain uh, across the area. So here's your pinpoint forecast. Notice we've got that system digging fairly low uh, into the state of Texas. What it's going to do is it's going to bring in a couple boundaries. Those are going to be the focus, I think, of where we see any of those rain and storms across the area and likely late Wednesday into the overnight hours on Thursday. Once we get that cold front to start rolling through, may see a few isolated showers wrapping around on the backside, but I really think as we progress even in towards the weekend, most of us are going to be enjoying some of that nicer weather. So Easter plans look good to go. Keep in mind, we have a little bit of a breeze out there, but overall you're going to really enjoy this weekend and I think you're going to enjoy next weekend too. We're just kind of sandwiching in some rain chances in between both weekends. So your work week might be met with a little bit of that rain, but I think the weekend plans where most of us are looking forward to getting outside and enjoying that nice weather. They look good to go. Great news too for folks being outside tomorrow. Should be a lot of yeah. pretty pictures uh, for Easter and Definitely. folks all dressed up. And what a difference though between what we saw just a week ago with the tornado mm -hmm. and, and Franklin, night and day different. It is. And the good news is, at least on the weekends where you have some time to get out there, clean up some of that storm damage, the weather should be cooperating pretty nice. Thank you very much, Erica. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Coming up in sports, we'll take you to the Mitchell Tennis Center to see if the Aggies could advance in the SEC championship. Plus, find out if the Texas A&M baseball team could get a series win over South Carolina. John has those stories and more next. Sports is sponsored by Allen Honda, corner of Southwest Parkway and Highway 6. Allen's got your Honda. From the KBTX Sports Center, News 3 Sports starts now. The ninth-ranked Texas A&M baseball team has been busy this week. Tuesday night, the Aggies were in Houston to face U of H. Wednesday, the team traveled to Columbia, South Carolina. Thursday, the Maroon and White beat the Gamecocks 8-2 in the series opener. Friday's second game of the series postponed due to bad weather, so the Aggies and Gamecocks played a pair of seven-inning games today. Asa Lacey got the start in the first game. He hit the first two batters, and Luke Berryhill makes him pay, hitting a three-run homer. That is one of just two hits Carolina would have in the game. The Aggies answer in the bottom of the second. Logan Foster sends the ball deep to right center field. That gets over the fence. The solo shot makes it a 3-1 game. Same frame, Hunter Watson singles to left. That allows Zach Deloach to score and cut the Carolina lead to 3-2. We have the same score in the seventh inning. Jonathan Dukoff at the plate as the go-ahead run, but he strikes out to end the game. South Carolina evens the series with a 3-2 win. So the Aggies look for a victory in game three to claim their fourth SEC series win of the season. The Aggie offense gets rolling in the third. Braden Shoemake sends a shot to right center. Bryce Blom and Zach Deloach both score on the double to push the A&M advantage to 3-0. Shoemake passes Chuck Knobloch for 8th place on Texas A&M's career RBI list with 148. Gamecocks respond in the bottom of the ending, inning, that is. George Khalil sends a ball to left field that Cam Blake dives for but doesn't get to. Noah Campbell would score from first base to cut the Aggie lead to 3-1. Blake makes up for 